I've always been really passionate about the challenge of thinking forward on what our things are made out of that we use every day. I do like to create something that speaks for itself so somebody can look at it and see the craftsmanship that goes into it and also make them think about how it was created and why, what the motivation is. And that keeps me inspired to really push the ball forward in terms of how a surfboard is made. We're surfers, we're in the ocean, and we have a reverence for the place that we're in. I think it's kind of paying homage to that as well. Surfboard sales, particularly in the last few years, have absolutely gone through the roof. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It means that there's probably three times as many surfers in the water now, which means three times as many surfboards that are made from unsustainable materials like fossil fuels, oils, resins, things that are actually used to make most surfboards. And so people have been exploring original material for building surfboards like wood in really innovative and unique ways. Danny Hess here in San Francisco is probably the leading light on that. My goal is to make them accessible for people. We're not trying to mass produce surfboards here. We're not trying to make as many as we can as fast as we can. I'm just focused on creating boards that the craftsmanship and quality is foremost. One of the greatest motivations was that I was taking salvaged wood and really just trying to push the ball forward and just see what alternative materials that aren't surfboard materials could make a successful surfboard. Foam is just a dead piece of material. It doesn't have a spring or a life to it. Whereas wood is, a, you know, you bend a piece of wood, it springs right back to it. Surfboards right now are not sustainable, except for wooden surfboards. And we need to move millions and millions of people towards products like those that are built to last, built from dramatically sustainable materials, materials that actually sequester carbon, you know, out of the air and lock it away in the surfboard under your feet. And just thinking about the materials that go into the surfboards that we use, is really important because I, I don't want to be surfing a surfboard that has to be replaced every year. The wood kind of is the starting point and dictates what kind of board we're going to build. I use a lot of different locally sourced salvaged wood from walnut to redwood, cypress, all kinds of different wood. The wood that I'm building this board out of is pretty special wood. It's out of an old Victorian from San Francisco. So I select the pieces that are gonna be appropriate, bring that into the shop here, and I use the chop saw to cut to length. The panels start out pretty raw, the edges are rough. There's not a true straight edge on anywhere. And so I use the Festool track saw that goes into the track and cuts an incredibly accurate straight line through the panel of wood. And then I'm taking those two separate pieces and gluing them together to create the panel that will become the surfboard. Once I create the panels, I template the outline of the board into the top of those panels. So you end up with essentially the outline of the surfboard in a flat panel of redwood. After that, I take that to the bandsaw and rough cut the outline of the surfboard. What I'm doing is creating a top panel, a bottom panel that are the shape of the surfboard. I also rough cut the frame parts that create the interior and rail parts of the surfboard. And those are the banana shaped pieces that you see me cutting out. Essentially what they're doing is creating a hollow cavity inside the surfboard. 
which removes a ton of weight, but also makes them really strong. So I create those frame parts, then I take them onto the table router and true them up so that each part is identical to each other. And then I take it into the shaping room and use a Japanese hand plane, as well as a belt sander. It creates a nice true part that has nice clean edges on it. And I do that on all the parts because you want to have clean pieces that you can accurately cut and assemble. I've made thousands of surfboards, so I can really, tr I really feel like I've developed a real trust in my eye. It took me many, many surfboards to get to that point where I feel very confident and comfortable with that. Surfboards are essentially a blend of art and science, and you really have to do the science part, the measuring, the math, and everything at the beginning, and then when you are really into the curves and the complex radiuses of the board, you really have to trust the art of it. About 2,000 boards into it, I started feeling like I just know what this needs to look like. But it took a lot of measuring and concentrating to get to that point. So the rocker is super fundamental part of what makes a surfboard work. It's the bottom curve of the surfboard. If you have a flat surfboard, it's just gonna go really fast, but the nose is gonna poke and you're gonna go over the front. If you have a really rockered surfboard, it's just gonna push water and bog. So you need to have an accurate curve. So to create that curve frame, I take those two interior frame parts and I roll glue between them. I use this 10 minute cure time, really fast poly expanding polyurethane glue. It's really amazing stuff, but it kicks really fast. So when you roll it out, all your clamps are ready, your parts are ready, you're ready, and you throw it in the mold, clamp it down, and just run those clamps around it really fast. It sits in that mold for two hours under all that pressure. Then you pull all the clamps off and it holds that curve. A lot of wooden surfboards back in the day were made from big blocks of wood and they would carve all that wood out. So there's all this wasted wood in the nose and tail. Whereas with this, I'm maximizing the use of the wood that I'm using and bending it into the curve, which I think creates a much stronger surfboard, the frame, and also just is way more efficient. You're not wasting into the wood. An all wooden surfboard is gonna beat a surfboard that's made from petroleum materials any day, all day. It's gonna outlast it, it's gonna outperform it. So I wanna make sure to give Danny the props that he deserves. His boards will be around for hundreds of years because they are tough, because they don't break, and they have great performance. People are gonna to wanna to keep them and keep them around. For the next step, I take it into the shaping room the shape room was designed with really specific side lights. I take it in there and strip all the glue off to just get it all cleaned up. I fine tune it with my power planer to clean up all the edges. And then I take the power planer and I put the foil into the frame. The foil is if you think about the way an airplane wing looks, if you look at the profile of it, it's elliptical. Surfboards have a foil to them just as an airplane wing does. So you're putting that foil into the bottom and the top of that frame. And that gives you a refined internal panel piece that you take back into the rocker bed and then take the deck panel, which is a full panel of wood, and bend that back into the rocker bed with glue and clamp it all up all the way down. Each piece is different. When you try and do them all at the same time, they can crack and break and they become very temperamental. You're just asking too much out of the wood. But when you do it in steps like that, you're able to really manipulate the wood in, in a way that you wouldn't if you really tried to force it. At this point, I've glued together the deck, the interior frame, and the bottom of the board. And it's essentially looking like a surfboard. It has the rough outline of a surfboard. And that's when you start laying your master template on there. And that creates your guide points for really drawing the curve. 
Every shaper has their master templates and the templates that they've created over just many years of evolving their designs. And this one is a, a template I call the Bella. It's named after a friend's daughter. The marks that I'm marking on the deck of the surfboard basically dictate the width that the surfboard needs to be. And then you're marking the nose and tail dimensions. Those dimensions are all super important to create a really nice blending curve that is pleasing to your eye. At this point, I really sharpen my tools, especially on old salvage redwood, you need to have really tuned sharp tools. And so I'll take out my sharpening blocks and really put some time into getting them razor sharp. At that point, you have your shape set. You have your length set, you have your width set, you have all your other dimensions set. So from there, I take up the power planer and really start truing up the outline to the shape that the board's gonna be. And once I true up the outline of the board, I flip it over and sand out the bottom with my Festool sander. And that really evens the whole bottom out and blends it all. From there, I map out my rail bands on the bottom, which are the curve of the rail of the surfboard. And I take the power planer again and just start putting that rail band in. So it's from sharp edge to soft edge to sharper edge from nose to tail. And you bring that in until you feel the right curvature. Then I take the Japanese block plane and I really tune that rail. I remove any little ridge. And then I lift it up and the underarm test is the true test of shaper. Like you put it under your arm and you feel that bottom edge and you know when it gets to the point where it's right. Then I take my sanding stick and I just shape in and blend in all those little rough edges that are left from the power tools and the block plane. And then I flip it over onto the deck and start taking the material out of the deck. That process is removing a lot of material. And once I get that to the point that I want it, I take the Festool sander and really blend in all those rough shaving marks then I'm using the power planer to blend the top rail into the bottom rail. I'm putting that curve into the board at that point. And essentially, this is the point where it's gone from becoming a block of wood to a surfboard. And then I sand it, fine tuning those curves. Then the shape of the board is done, it's finished sanded, it's ready for fin markings. This one is specifically is a twin fin. So I take my fin template, mark the outline of the fin, rough cut that out on the bandsaw, and then true that up on the stationary belt sander. I then take that outline of the fin into my shaping room and clamp it down on my shaping stand and take my angle grinder and put in the foil, which is that teardrop shape. And then you have a fin that's ready to be cut into the bottom of that board. And then I just put my Hess stamp on the tail, write the dimensions, which are the length, the width, the thickness of the board. From there, I take my silk screen and stick it onto the deck of the board, silk screen it on there, flip it over, do the same on the bottom. And essentially you've got a finished board that just needs to be sealed. I have this specific natural oil called Monocoat that I use to seal the board. And it's a really amazing oil that just penetrates deep into the redwood and really creates a shell or a skin that repels water. I oil the fins at that point put my special glue on the very base of the fin, the bottom, and wedge it into the slot. Make sure the fin's in the exact right position. And then essentially, there you go, you have a finished surfboard. So at this point, the board's done and you just have to be patient, wait for the oil to dry, the fins to dry, and then I usually get so excited, I just paddle out in whatever waves I can find. And just, cause I, I know I, I wanna feel the board. I wanna feel how it moves through the water. And that's the best part. As soon as you kind of baptize the surfboard, you feel how it 
pushes under waves and you know as soon as you paddle for a wave, it engages, it catches the wave smoothly, quickly, and that first bottom turn tells you so much in terms of how that board's gonna work. Because each board has its own personality. That's such an exciting part because there's so much anticipation. I have this idea, I wanna make this surfboard work this way for this specific wave, and then that moment of truth, yes, it works. That's the best feeling. Surfboard builders like Danny Hess are not just a symbol of sustainability for our sport, they're the absolute pinnacle, right? Our hope is that the rest of the surfboard industry can adopt some of those same practices that Danny and others have, particularly with wooden surfboards, and incorporate them into the mass-produced surfboards so that we're dramatically lowering the impact that they're making and hopefully even leaving a positive legacy in their wake.